All right, another video on the false royal family over there, something I forgot to mention with the other one. Um, and that is the fact that the devil gives these people money, but it's not really their money. It's just kind of, they stick them in there. They're actors. Uh, I mean, you can see what they do. They don't really do anything. You know, uh, shake hands and cut ribbons and, you know, wave and whatever else and things. Make appearances and, you know, making 30 plus thousand pounds, you know, for an hour of work, uh, they say. But, uh, <laughs> nice. But uh, there's also the thing of the papal connection. You see, the, uh, the nation of England there, um, they gave us this King James Bible, the greatest book that's ever existed on earth. In all of history, all of recorded history, nothing better than the King James Bible, documented historical fact. And so the Vatican, in their bitterness and their hatred, uh, they, they always have to get back at uh, really strong movements that make them look stupid, which is what the Protestant movement was all about. I would identify with the Protestant movement because I do protest Rome, but I am not a Protestant reformer. You can't reform something that God has already preordained in his word, Revelation 17 and 18, that he's going to destroy. The Vatican is a cursed, satanic system, and uh, if you're a Roman Catholic, you need to get out of it. It's a very wicked thing. But uh, the, again, the hypocrisy here, although King Charles is the defender of the Protestant faith or whatever they say, the, the Church of England, um, he's a defender of the Protestants, but yet now they're openly working with the Roman Catholics. And they're really pushing for this thing. Um, so let's watch these three videos here. They're just short little videos. And I'm going to make some comments as we go through. And again, just showing the paganism of Roman Catholicism. That's not what Jesus Christ founded, according to his word. And it's even according to Roman Catholic, you know, the Dewey Reams or whatever else you want to use. Um, Catholicism doesn't line up with the Bible. Even if you pervert the scriptures like the Catholics have done down through the centuries with their uh, corrupted manuscripts and everything else, the minority manuscripts, when compared with the received text um, preserved through the uh, Greek Orthodox system, which I believe goes back to the first century. But that's a whole other issue. But let's listen to this video here. I'll make some comments as we go through. But if you're not aware of this, if you're you know British or even if you're here in America or wherever other country, understand that the Roman Catholics Right now, what they're trying to do is they're they're raising the left so that they can ignite the right and then bring in their synthesis, which is going to be, you know, the alt-right system, essentially. Um, and they'll be drawing in some people that are currently what they would call leftists or whatever, but it will be convert or die in the future. So that'll bring in the people. You have a lot of uh, Christian Catholics, we like to call them. Christmas and Easter is when they go to church. And a lot of those are nominal. They would be called the liberal Catholics, according to the Tradcat system. But this whole thing is you have the really radical alt-right, and they will come to power, but they're going to be drawing people from the left over to them. So it's going to be somewhat of a synthesis there. Just to explain what the future prophecies are, the time will come when they that kill you will think that they do God's service. Prophecy from the scripture. And, you know, the Roman Catholic motto of for the greater glory of God, the Jesuit motto there, but that's very much what's behind this whole system. They make these two opposing things, and you're either with the right or with the left, and you know, and then they merge things together. But let's watch this. Pope Francis is sending a representative to the coronation tomorrow of King Charles III in England. Cardinal Pietro Perlin, the Holy See Secretary of State, will join world leaders and other dignitaries. Also, for the first time since the Reformation in the 1500s, a Catholic prelate will formally participate in the coronation. For the first time since the 1500s. Is that significant? Mm -hmm. You better pay attention. This isn't just some kind of a little, oh, okay, well, you know, they're just kind of doing, no, this is major stuff. This is very big. This is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. You know, she commits mystery Babylon, the system there, her purples are purple and uh, scarlet. Hmm. Bishops in purple, cardinals in scarlet. Uh, but uh, she reigns over the kings of the earth. Hmm. That's what the King James Bible says proven 
to be exactly correct. Uh, is it the uh, guy there? Are they going to coronate uh, some king of America? No. All the stupid nonsense. Oh, America's Mystery Babylon. Nonsense. It's total nonsense. Again, that's part of the, one of the papal lies that they'll say, America's Mystery Babylon. America's the one that's guilty of all that stuff. And, you know, okay, how's America a city? How does America sit on seven hills? How does America reign over the kings of the earth? <laughs> it doesn't. Okay. But, uh, oh, it's a mystery. But mystery Babylon is America. And so when America falls, then we'll say, Babylon has fallen. Yay. You know, and, oh, Jesus came back. Oh, you mean the Antichrist? That's what they're setting up. All right. So don't waste your time in the comments. Oh, I respectfully disagree or something. Or you're so angry. <laughs> I love that one. I get that all the time. Um, no, the Roman Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18. Proven historical fact. Let's continue. Cardinal Vincent Nichols of Westminster is set to give a blessing shortly after King Charles is crowned. We go now to Edward Petten, Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, who is in England right now for the coronation. Ed, great to have you back. Good to see you. Um, so talk to us about this. How significant is it? The Cardinal Nichols will give the formal blessing, and what might it signal for the future of Catholic Anglican relations? Yes, well, this is very historic, Tracy. I mean, this is the first time that a Catholic bishop has taken part in the coronation since the 16th century, since Bishop Stephen Gardner crowned Queen Mary. So it is a very significant, um, significant development, and it's really also because Catholics, until uh, Vatican II, weren't actually allowed into a church that wasn't a Catholic church. So it's uh, that's also partly why in the coronation of the Queen Elizabeth in 1953, there were no Catholic bishops or, or Catholics present, although there were some Catholics, of course, because uh, the person who organizes the, the coronation is has traditionally always been a Catholic, the Duke of... Uh, really? person who you know, gets the coronation thing there. They've traditionally always been a Catholic. Interesting. Norfolk. So, um, so that's very significant. It, it, um, I think it points to how um, the relations between Catholics and Anglicans have changed in some ways for the better, in some ways not. Um, but they have become closer in some ways um, since the Second Vatican Council. And I think this possibly reflects that. And, and what can you tell us about Cardinal Nich Nichols uh, specifically? Uh, we understand he's heavily involved in promoting Christian unity. Yes, he is. And uh... Uh, Christian unity? No, no, no. Catholic control is what that means. There's no Christian unity. Um, I think he's uh, looking at comments that he said about taking part in this. He's very happy to do so. I think... Um, and his, he's actually going to give a blessing at the coronation, uh, one of several who does give a blessing, and um, <laughs> comes at a significant moment in the coronation, just after the crown is placed on the king's head. Okay, he's going to give a blessing at the coronation. Okay, then if he's a real true man of God, then England should prosper. And if he's a servant of the devil, a minister of Satan, Second Corinthians chapter 11, um, then England will have a lot more problems. So we'll see. Let's be fair. Let's be open about this, all right? If he's a man of God, England will prosper. If he's a man of Satan, England will fall. Remember that. So I think he feels very privileged um, to be doing that. And um, yes, as I say, it is, it is uh, very historic in the sense that it hasn't been done for, for 500 years. Yeah, very historic indeed. And as you mentioned, uh, Pope Francis is sending uh, the Vatican Secretary of State there. He also donated a relic of the true cross for the coronation. What more can you tell us about that? <laughs> what a bunch of pagans. Uh, uh, he donated a relic of the true cross for the coronation. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, chapter and book, chapter and verse on that, please. You know, Jesus comes out off the cross, you know, and they, they, the apostles come and they say, um, we need the true cross, please. We're going to take it. We're going to, you know, have it in little pieces that we can take it around and, and hold it up and say, look, ooh, ooh, look, look. <laughs> um, the funny thing is about that, though, or the sad thing, if you want to say it that way, by saying we have a piece of the true cross, 
you are literally no longer living by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that. Well, it's to inspire greater devotion. Oh, you mean sight? You mean sight? Uh, yeah, the uh, huge cathedrals and the men walking around with robes on, with gold gilt thread and gold staffs and all this other stuff, and the mitres and things, and all the crowns and all the other stuff, and all the wealth of Mystery Babylon. Oh, it's to inspire worship. It's a, a veneration, and, and I shouldn't say worship because they'll say, oh, no, it's not worship. You know, we don't worship Mary, we venerate her. Okay, yeah. Think about that. There's nothing in the New Testament about this. They're walking around holding up the true cross. Look, it's the board which Jesus, you know, the, the beam which Jesus was crucified on. Why would you keep that? Sick people. See, that proves, again, it's another proof, just simple proof. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says. We're supposed to have faith in Jesus Christ, not by sight. We don't live by sight. But the Catholics, oh, look, it's a piece of the true cross. Oh, well, let's bow to it. Pagans. Pagan, satanic nonsense. And I'm, I'm not just trying to be mean here. I mean, that's, you know, I'm trying to wake people up. But it's I'm just using real true terms to explain this whole thing. It's pagan to venerate objects. It's not what the Bible teaches. It is satanic because you are departing from Scripture while claiming to believe in Scripture. Let's continue. Yes, well, Cardinal Parolin, uh, as being the first papal representative to participate in a in in a coronation uh, for 500 years, that's another historic uh, first for 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 the modern times. Um, but yes, also the these relics, uh, these two fragments of the True Cross. Um, are actually going to be integrated into the processional cross. Um, so they're not alone. They are a gift to uh, to the king uh, from Pope Francis. Um, it's uh, some some are concerned that they say you know it's okay to give such relics to the Orthodox. They they believe in the they have the seven sacraments. The Anglican Church doesn't have the seven sacraments. The rites and ordinations are invalid. So so there is some controversy about that. But I think generally it's seen as a as a very um, positive ecumenical gesture. Yeah, okay, um, <clears throat> so the seven sacraments. Yep, uh, I don't remember reading anything about a sacrament in here. Yeah, and millions of people uh, in the UK and, of course, around the world uh, will be watching tomorrow. Tell us about the atmosphere there right now, Ed. Yes, well, it's very much a festive atmosphere. It's uh, lots of bunting and uh, British flags flying everywhere. Uh, there'll be, I think tomorrow, I mean, it's going to be a long weekend. There's going to be a public holiday on Monday. So it's a long weekend of festivities and we'll have um, plenty of street parties, which is what's usually done at this time, uh, where lots of, uh, it's a great community time, great time for, for communities to get together and celebrate uh, the coronation of the new monarch. And uh, this is a tradition that goes back very far. And then also I'm curious about, you know, in what ways has this ceremony been influenced by the Catholic faith? What can you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, this is very interesting because the coronation is, is, is probably the most Catholic state liturgy or state ceremony that we have. In fact, 973 was the first coronation of King Edgar, and that was the first consecration of a king in the country and it is a very catholic um liturgy it's it's um the pope the the king will be anointed it won't be seen when he's anointed he'll be anointed with holy oils and uh these go um over the, the upper part of the body and then then these oils are actually consecrated in jerusalem and so I think it shows very much the the temporal and spiritual nature of the monarchy and often that's forgotten the the temporal and spiritual nature of the monarchy. Uh, where's my book at? Here it is. The church teaches, right here, I've showed this thing many times, documents of the church in English translation by Jesuit fathers of St. Mary's College. Showed this thing many times. Um, see if I can get to this quote really quickly here. Um, this thing of the temporal and the the, the uh, spiritual and temporal swords, um, that whole thing right there, a lot of people don't realize that, but the fact is that they 
the Vatican controls the different kings. I'm going to have to find this as I'm playing the rest of the video, but uh, I'll get back to playing it here, and I'll, I'll find the quote, and I'll read it, but it's very important to understand this. Spiritual aspect of the monarchy, uh, but you'll see it very much in the, in the coronation rites. Um, for example, he's, he receives an orb, which is set under the cross, and um, it says in the liturgy that, remember, always the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It's very much Christocentric in that way. Um, and as I say, that goes right back to, to the Catholic roots of the coronation. Well, Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about all this very exciting. Uh, thank you again. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. Found it here. Uh, page 74, it says, right here, I'll show it here when I'm done. We are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under its control, there are two swords, the spiritual and the, t and the temporal. Both of these, that is the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church. The second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hand of the priest. The second by the hand of kings, Charles. And soldiers, but at the wish and by per the permission of the priests. Sword must be subordinated to sword, and it is only fitting that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. Let's see if I can show this thing here on camera. Hopefully, you can read that. It's in other videos, I've shown it many times. But that's what you hear when you, or that's what you should understand when you read this thing about the spiritual and the temporal swords. It's talking about the Vatican controlling governments, just like the Bible says. So there's non, there's this thing of, oh, America's mystery Babylon. That's just nonsense. But uh, here we go again. Learn the Catholic roots of the coronation ceremony. All right. Uh, Rome, ancient Rome. Um, when they were falling as a, an empire in Italy, they were they kept trying to go and they kept trying to take over uh, Britannia and Germania, and they pretty much got Germania first, and then it was like Br Britannia. They were going after that. So you had the Holy Roman Empire underneath uh, Charlemagne, and then they were going after all these British kings as well. So Rome as a nation, it was it never the fifth kingdom. Rome morphed into the fifth kingdom. It you know. The kingdoms, the five different kingdoms that are prophesied in the book of Daniel, you have the head of gold, which was Babylon. Then you have the media Persian, which was the silver, the chest of silver. And then you have the bronze that came after that, Greece. And then you have Rome, the two legs of iron, the iron legions of Rome. And then it, it doesn't go, it's, you know, gold to silver, silver to uh, brass, and then brass to iron. But then it doesn't go iron to clay. It says Iron and miry clay is the feet of that image, part weak, part strong. So the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman Empire never went away. It morphed into the Roman Catholic Church. And then they have been controlling different countries through the kings and through the governments of those different countries. And so the Revolutionary War, I believe it was somewhat real for a little while, but um, that we'd won independence here in America because Bible-believing men back then stood up and fought against the Roman Catholic king uh, that was con being controlled by the Roman Catholic Church back then. And uh, King George, I think it was, the third or something, I forget, but he was controlled by the Jesuits. We fought against that to win our freedom here in America. But the reality of it is, you know, England still pretty much controls America. We're just the uh, strong arm, you know, the NATO Soldiers are the ones that go out and do the Vatican's bidding right now. Any heretic country that doesn't submit to Rome, we go and we wage war against them to bring them freedom. Yeah. So that's the reality of things. Never forget that. All right. But Italy was where Roman power was at one point in time, and then they moved it up into Germany with the Holy Roman Empire, and now it's been moved over to the UK. And it's been there for a long time. That's why they hated Oliver Cromwell, because he made some problems in their system there. 
King Charles I was the one that was married to a Roman Catholic. The, um, I think she was a princess of France or something like that, but she was Roman Catholic. And uh, they were basically waging war against the people of England. And back then there was a lot of Bible believers. It was right around the time right after King James, Charles's father, had authorized the translation of the authorized version. That's what it was originally called. It was later nicknamed the King James Version because of King James's protection there and uh, of the translators. But this great Bible, after it's finished, then this, you know, King James uh, kind of went downhill after that and passed away. He was an older man at that time. And his son comes to power and King James said, no future king, no future monarch is supposed to be Catholic. And his son Charles marries a Catholic. And then he starts to work with the Catholic Church to wage war against his own people. The Irish Catholic armies and everything else that he was working with to try to come in and sub subdue the people of England. And thankfully they fought against it. And I believe at that point in time, the throne was cut off. And no godly king ever sat on the throne after that. And Charles, or, uh, when Charles was executed, um, Oliver Cromwell became the Lord Protector. And he made the famous statement that Christ and not man is king. Or Christ not man is king. I think is how it was. And yeah, Jesus Christ is supposed to be the king, the leader of the Bible-believing movement. The church of Jesus Christ. Not the Pope. Okay. But since then... England has gotten worse and worse. Um, but for hundreds of years, when this Bible was still being read by the common people, and the people were living by this King James Bible, uh, England prospered. England did very well. But now, but the Catholic, you know, roots were there that whole time. And they were putting Catholic monarchs in. They're all subservient to Rome. And you'll see that again with this video. Let's watch this one. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us. First... Tell us about the significance of the Holy Father's gift. The Holy Father has given two tiny fragments of the true cross. Yeah. Um, okay, Holy Father, that's blasphemy. That's God's title. All right. No man on earth is supposed to be called Holy Father. That is a satanic thing to do. So right away, oh, we're Christ Church. Then why would you take God's title? What, so many, anybody in the Bible, when was Peter ever called the Holy Father? Not one verse of scripture proving that. Blasphemy. And again, you see, we have to get the pagan thing. Oh, two pieces of the original, you know, the true cross. And oh, it's such a wonderful thing. Uh, if you have pieces of the cross, wouldn't you want to assemble the whole thing and have the whole cross someplace where people can go and bow down to it? Kiss it or something like that? the very cross on which our Savior died. And this will be carried in procession. They've been put into a beautiful silver cross. It couldn't be more significant. Mm. It couldn't be more significant. Given the troubled history of Britain, everyone knows the Reformation story and so on, this is a very moving and beautiful gift. Uh, troubled history? Oh, that's right, because we went, because the British went against the Catholics. We, as in Bible believers. That's troubled history. <laughs> okay. That wicked papists. Damnation is just. And it comes at the first coronation of the 21st century, in, you know, having passed the millennium. And it reminds us of the unbroken record of Christianity in our country. Troubled, muddled, confused, but going all the way back. All the way back. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I want to dig into that. It's definitely going to be a Protestant service, but how does this Catholic symbolism that we know is so rich of the coronation speak to the potential Christian unity despite the Reformation? Well, I wouldn't really say that it's a Protestant service. Um, we don't tend to use the word Protestant much in Britain as much as we used to. In all uh, Yeah, because you've gone over to the Rome, to the Vatican system, to Rome. See, all the people, I know there's brethren in the UK, a lot of you are friends of the ministry, praise the Lord for you. And I'm sure this is just as vexing to you as it is to me. But 
the people of England have gotten sidetracked. They've forgotten what happened during all those years of people being burned at the stake and tortured to death by the Vatican, the Roman Catholic system. And they think, oh, that won't ever happen again. That was in the past. That, that won't ever happen again. Completely ignorant of what the Bible says is going to happen in the end times. It's disgusting. Honesty, it's an entirely Catholic service in terms of the wording and the structure and everything. Any Catholic will recognize it as being framed around the Eucharist. But of course, yes, uh, the Anglican Church is not Catholic. The orders of the Archbishop of Canterbury are not valid and so on. Of course. But I wouldn't say it's Protestant in the sense of protesting against Catholicism. It is rich in Catholic symbolism. Catholics, um, uh, for the last several uh, coronations, have understood that. And this time, because we are in a warmer ecumenical atmosphere, uh, we've had two wonderful papal visits to our country and so on, uh, the Catholics... Well, again, disgusting. Same thing with here in America. The first president to allow the Pope to set his disgusting feet on the shores of this country was Ronald Reagan which a lot of the Baptist and conservative Christian types, they say, oh, he was a great man, greatest president that we've had in the last hundred years and, and whatever. Yeah, Red Ronnie, the old communist actor. Yeah, kind of like Trump, actors. Disgusting. The Catholic side of things will come up very strongly. So really, there is a very strong Catholic symbolism, and the whole idea of the anointing, very familiar to Catholics, the Eucharist, of course, very rich. Oh, it's going to be very important. Right. What can you tell us about that anointing and the oils that are used? Well, these oils, and this is very interesting, were blessed in the Holy Land by an Orthodox uh, uh, cleric. So there is, again, something rich going on here. That's a very Catholic idea. If you look at the coronations in the 18th century, they were you know, definitely Protestant, although they followed the old Catholic ritual. But the anointing with oil, having it blessed, that wasn't really the sort of thing they liked to do. It's very significant that Prince Charles, whose father, of course, Prince Philip, was an Orthodox Christian, Prince Philip of Greece, you know, uh, he's always been interested in the Orthodox Church and, indeed, in, in Christian unity. If he's from Greece, why would uh, that, how would that make Charles a real true, you know, man of British descent? It's kind of odd. But, you know, who cares about that, I guess, right? So there's a richness there that was missing from, from earlier coronations of recent centuries, yes. Something to watch for sure. In March, pledges were made by various denominations, led by the example of Cardinal Vincent Nichols of Westminster. What did this entail, this, this kind of Christian unity? Well, the, the, the king, a, a new king by at that point, uh, gave an audience, uh, as one says, you know, they all gathered together, representatives of different faiths in Britain. And Cardinal Vincent gave an absolutely beautiful address. Each one spoke, and he gave an absolutely beautiful address. I've got a copy of it here, because <laughs> it's just been published in the new May edition of the Westminster Cathedral magazine, which is a lovely glossy mm. magazine produced each month for which I happen to write, actually. Um, but he ends up, God bless your majesty and your queen consort. I'm looking down and reading it. Preserve you both in health of mind and body and grant you every grace and blessing now and for the years to come. And he assured his majesty of the prayers of the Catholic community. So very, very important. Catholics in Britain are loyal to the crown. It's very important to us. Yes, and the number... And why wouldn't they be? Charles isn't any kind of a threat to any Roman Catholic uh, scheming and whatever else. He's part of it. <laughs> Terrible. Of Catholics and Anglicans is relatively similar, hovering at about 13 and 14 percent. Does rising secularism contribute to this public alliance that we saw under Queen Elizabeth? And do you think that'll continue under King Charles? You kind of alluded to that just now. Well, there will be friendship. Um, the days of real antagonism have gone. But there are difficulties now because the poor Anglican Church, I mean, they ordained women, and that looks rather wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong to us, especially ladies in mitres. It's, they don't mean to be insulting, but to a Catholic, it's, it, it, it's so wrong and contrary to what our Lord instituted. And they've just had a vote at their general synod saying it is possible to bless the same-sex union. And this is a great pity because 
I mean, a lot of my Anglican friends are in agony about all of this because mm. they're rather traditional Christians. Um, uh huh. See the Hegelian dialectic being brought in again? The left versus the right. We need to merge together. My Anglican friends, we're Catholic and Anglican. We're friends. See? The Catholic Church is using this whole thing. Satan behind the Catholic Church is using this whole thing to bring up that Roman Catholic system in the future. That's exactly what's going on. Bible prophecy being fulfilled. If you're Catholic, how do you line up with this whole thing? You know, the New Testament teaches that the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine. That there's going to be less of us as time goes by. Not a movement of people being brought over to Christianity in the end times. Uh, and we've stood together on so many issues. So I, I do see a problem there. Rising secularism is, is a big problem. Uh, and the, the, the church is... Why is rising secularism secularism a big problem? Um, who brought that in? It's people moving away from the King James Bible. That's what makes secularism rise. And you look at a lot of the guys that were part of those different things, like George Lemaitre or whatever, the, the uh, Jesuit guy that came out with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name right now. Another Jesuit that came out with the New Age thing. Telhard de Chardin or something like this. Trained Bertrand Russell, came out with all the atheism stuff, you know. Yeah. How did secularism come about? Well, that's right, it was scheming for the Catholic Church that brought it about. So that we could eventually just bring, bring everybody back to the Roman Catholic system again with the counter-reformation of the Jesuits. Check out what I'm saying, it's all true. Of all denominations are in many ways reeling from shock after shock of a lot of things we all I didn't particularly personally but people felt would never change and they are changing particularly mm -hmm. marriage and family but I think there will continue to be goodwill it's up to Catholics really to drive this with large minds and to, to, to stop trying to sort of you know score points against Anglicans and uh, uh, any old talk of oh they took our own churches they, we live with what we've got and what we've got in spite of difficulties is a certain amount of goodwill and I think that the, the king, whose own life and, and the way he grew up, was in an age of increasing ecumenism. Mm -hmm. And I think that will very much be his motive. And he's a regular churchgoer. By all accounts, it means a great deal to him. So I think we, we can, uh, at least at this time of the coronation, have hopes of goodwill. And Catholics must stand firm for the beautiful truths of the moral life in particular, which are written into every human heart and I think a lot of Anglicans will rally to that. And it's what we I have in that's... common, absolutely. Uh, Joanna, yeah. two quick questions, um, just to make sure we don't run out of time. The first one is about uh, something that I didn't get to ask you about, which is the crown. Tell us a little bit about the crown. Well, there are various crowns. He will be crowned with a great ancient heavy crown and then, because it's very difficult to wear it all the way home, he will wear <laughs> another crown, one that is used for the state opening of Parliament. Uh, crowning is a very ancient Christian tradition, and the idea is that... A part very ancient Christian tradition? Um, could you give me one verse of scripture that says that uh, uh, Christians or whatever else should be crowned on earth? Crowning comes at the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. Part of the thinking is uh, you, you, you have to understand, the king has to understand that our saviour wore only a crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. So there is this sense of carrying a burden and responsibility there. Very important. That's a very significant burden. Um, what can you tell us about how Camilla will be included in the coronation? I know that she's a figure of great controversy for many. The union that is being blessed now feels controversial to some and has been criticized. Give us some context as Catholics of how we can celebrate this coronation and this union. Well, we're not really being asked to celebrate the union. These are two old people who have been together now for a great many years, and we must assume that at this stage anyway the, they, they are companions and that's not going to change and that's for life. Um, she is less controversial than she used to be and without going into any of the details, much of which we don't really know, I think the general feeling in Britain is let's make a go of this because 
um, the, 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 the public breakdown of the king's marriage and everything was, was so terrible uh, for everybody's morale, and it certainly robbed the crown of a great deal of possible dignity. I, don't want, I think the British approach is let's make a go of this. Um, but, of course, we know that the, it is not God's plan. God's plan is for one man, one woman, in marriage for life. And uh, Camilla is divorced from her, incidentally, Catholic uh, husband who went on to marry someone else. So, yes, that's the situation. I guess Anyone? they'll let our lords sort it out. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this illuminating discussion. I know that we will watch eagerly both the recaps and also just all of the symbolism. Yeah, all of the symbolism, man. Yeah. All right, one more to do here real quick on this whole thing of the papal uh, connections to the false royals, the little actors over there. There we go. As we reported earlier, today was the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II. And among the 2,000 mourners inside of Westminster Abbey were a number of faith leaders, including some from the Catholic Church. We go now to Fiorella Nash, UK journalist and author who is based just outside of London. Fiorella, thank you so much for your time today. Um, what more can you tell us about the state funeral and also which Catholic leaders were present? Well, it was very significant how different this funeral was to the last monarch's funeral. Of course, there are a lot of things that are the same, but what was most significant, this was a deeply Christian event, as one ought to expect from the, the, the funeral of the, the former head of the Church of England, governor of the Church of England, but there were a number of Catholic faith leaders represented, and most significantly, you had leaders from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England. You had uh, Archbishop Cushley of St. Andrews in Edinburgh, Archbishop Marco Tall of Cardiff, Eamon Martin of Armagh, and Cardinal Vincent Nichols played a significant role in the funeral. This is something that has not happened for hundreds of years. Our last Catholic monarch was James II, who was... Okay, again, it hasn't happened for hundreds of years. Wake up, you know, counter-reformation, final moments of it. ...deposed, and of course, famously, Charles II converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. So to have a Catholic leader take such a prominent role in the Queen's funeral is something extraordinary and something that would not have happened, I think, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah, it really is quite remarkable. Um, can you talk to us about the relationship between the late Queen and the Catholic Church? She had a very cordial relationship with the Catholic Church. She met five popes during her lifetime. The first, of course, when she was still a princess. When she was Princess Elizabeth, she met Pius the Twelfth, which gives you some idea of the the many epochs her reign covered, that she met so many different popes. But most significantly, she welcomed two popes onto English soil. Pope John Paul II was, like Queen Elizabeth, a trailblazer. He was the first pope ever to set foot on English soil, and she was there to welcome him. She also, of course, welcomed Pope Benedict. And the messages I'm seeing, the observations that the different popes made of Queen Elizabeth was that they had a lot of shared interests, shared concerns. They respected her dignity, her commitment to her Christian faith. So it seems that she always did have a very good relationship with the Catholic faith. She was very committed to ecumenism. She oversaw Britain becoming much more of a multicultural society, and she was very supportive of that, and I think her son, King Charles, will be very similar. Aha. Uh -huh. You have to fight. It's disgusting seeing this whole thing. Well, the ecumenical movement, and, and uh, yeah, we're going to be much more supportive of the papists taking over. And I was going to just ask you that kind of segue into that. You know, we talk about the Queen's, uh, about her strong Christian faith. What about King Charles III? I do know that he is a longtime supporter of a Christian organization known for helping those who face persecution. What can you tell us about that? Yes. 
With Queen Elizabeth, it was always very clear her Christian faith was central to everything she did, her sense of public duty and service. She very frequently rep um, referred to her Christian faith in her Christmas messages, for example. But uh, how about her drinking? <laughs> she drank quite a bit of alcohol, so let's continue. I think King Charles is going to be very similar. He has already sworn an oath to protect the Protestant faith, the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. <laughs> sworn an oath to protect the Protestant faith and then yoking up with Catholicism. What a scam. But he is also very committed to ecumenism and interfaith dialogue. He pledged a few days ago to protect faith and to keep a, a safe space for to protect space for all faiths in Britain, and that of course will. How can you protect uh, have a space for all faiths? Uh, Bible believing Christianity. I mean, there's you know, I believe in liberty of conscience, of course, but to say anybody can be here and whatever. Well, there's people that are trying to destroy Bible believing Christianity. Weird. Continue. I mean the Catholic faith as well. It, it, the Catholic representatives were part of over 30 faith leaders who were present at that meeting. He has also been a very dedicated supporter of Aid to the Church in Need, which is a charity that was set up after the Second World War when you had a huge number of refugees coming across to, into Germany initially from Eastern Europe. But of course, more recently, it hasn't just been Catholics in former communist countries, it has been Christians living in any country in the world where there is widespread persecution of Christians. And King Charles has been very strong in his support. He has met with the survivors of persecution. He has spoken passionately about the incredible courage and steadfastness of Christians in the Middle East. So that is a very good sign for the future. Oh, Fiorella, thank you so much for your time today and speaking with us. I'm sure it's a very good sign for the future. Uh, yeah, it's called Catholic armies being brought into different nations. So, <laughs> but uh, just wanted to make this video again to add to the whole thing. The false royals, they're actors, they're not real. Um, and they're just completely in bed with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, brethren, we have to fight. That's our duty. As Bible-believing Christians, as born-again Christians, we have to fight against the Roman Catholic Church. Um, constantly expose them, constantly remind people that the Catholics persecute others. And right now, the whole ecumenical movement, whatever else, was designed as a smokescreen to distract people from away from thinking that the Catholic Church believes that they should execute heretics. That's still there. Okay, the Office of Inquisition never was closed down. Right. I forget what they call it now. One of you can put it in the comments. Um, I can look it up in things. But the whole point is, um, it's still there. They still believe that heretics should be put to death. They're just waiting for the right time until they have enough power. That's why we have to continue to fight against the Roman Catholic system. Continue to expose that they control these false royals. Because if we stop fighting against it, and we let this world uh, get our attention and things, um, they're going to come to power while we're still here on the earth. We have to hold them off the best, as best as we can until the resurrection of the body of Christ, until we leave, until we get called up to be with the Lord, uh, before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started, okay, which I've proved in hundreds of studies down through the years. All the stupid heretics that come out, oh, you know, we're going to go through the Great Tribulation. No, we're not. Okay, It's not even for the church. It's for the nation of Israel. But whatever. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please continue to fight against the Catholics if you're saved and born again.